Thank you and thank you and good morning, uh, Mr. Speaker and members of the uh, 18th Legislature. My name is uh, Fraulein Cruz Denorio, and I like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk <coughs> about the uh, about House Resolution 18-2. The attempt to impeach Governor Benigno Fitio is a misguided use of raw political power that will bring shame to the Commonwealth and negatively affect our democracy for years to come. <clears throat> there is no doubt that the new House majority has the votes to impeach the Governor. The question is whether they should do so, they should not, and here's why. <clears throat> The new majority didn't control enough seats in the previous legislature to impeach the governor. Do we want a government where our elected governor is removed as soon as the opposition forms a majority? That's what they do in some other countries, but not in any United States jurisdiction. What does that do to the separation of powers guaranteed to us in Section 203A of the Covenant? It is a bad precedent to set and the new House majority should realize that this could happen to a governor of their party when they no longer have a majority. <clears throat> Impeachment should be reserved for proven violations of the most serious offenses. House Resolution 18-2 makes a lot of accusations against the governor but has not offered any proof. Even where the facts are not an issue, the House majority has not proved that they constitute felonies, corruption, or neglect of duty as required by the Constitution for impeachment. Impeachment should only be used to protect the people of the Commonwealth, not for a political vendetta. The rest of the world will look at us as no better than countries where political power ranks higher than the rule of law. Let's face it. The federal government has a debt crisis and a spending crisis. It is looking for any place where it can cut funds without antagonizing an important constituency. If it sees us as engaging in petty political feuds and impeaching governors for political purposes, we could find our federal grants and programs drying up so that the federal government can save its money or use it elsewhere. The governor is accused by the House majority of committing felonies, but he has never even been indicted, let alone convicted, in federal or commonwealth court. Don't you think that the U.S. attorney is in a better position to decide whether there is enough evidence to suggest a federal felony? In the commonwealth, if the attorney general has a conflict of interest, an independent Council or special prosecutor could be appointed to investigate the governor. What makes the House majority think it knows more than the prosecutors about criminal offenses? Many of the allegations against the governor relate simply to the normal functioning of our government. The governor is accused of not filling certain vacancies within prescribed time periods. In some cases, however, they already have been filled or a candidate nominated or the Senate is expecting a nomination in the near future. So even if the governor missed some overly optimistic deadlines, he has cured or is curing that with recent and current appointments. I know that it is not always easy to find the right person to fill a high level position. The person must be competent to do the job and be acceptable both to the governor and to a majority of the Senate. Did the House majority want the governor to nominate someone regardless of competence just to beat the deadline? I don't think so. Or rather, I don't think anyone other than these House members likes the idea of removing a governor for such a flimsy reason. Several charges arise from allegations by the House majority members that the governor somehow interfered with the service of a summons on the former Attorney General. However, the House majority does not supply any testimony or document that links the governor to that incident. So they made it up and put it in the resolution, perhaps hoping that something might turn up later. That throws out Articles 
4, 6, and 11 of the resolution. However, there are more things wrong about the view of this incident by the House majority. The summons might not have been valid. Attorneys for the former Attorney General claim that the law requires a summons that should be signed by a judge, but that this one was not. Also, there is a constitutional and legal question whether the Office of the Public Auditor, which sought the summons, is permitted to prosecute violations of Commonwealth law. That seems to be reserved to the Attorney General. Neither of these issues has yet been adjudicated. Also, a summons would not have prevented the former Attorney General from leaving the Commonwealth. It was not an arrest warrant, as some would have you believe. The only penalty for not appearing on a summons is a bench warrant, which has been issued, and the former Attorney General has indicated his willingness to return to the CNMI. So the system is working the way it is supposed to work. In any case, there is no indication of the governor's involvement. Speaker, privilege. With all due respect to the uh, former governor, no. just want to remind you of the time limit. Thank you, Floor. Um, Mr. Tenorio, perhaps you can wrap up. We'll allow you a minute or two to wrap up. Well, um, let me just continue then. Another incident that the House majority uses to impeach the governor is his employment of a federal detainee, a skilled massage therapist whom he had hired previously to help relieve this excruciating back pain. In another case of so-called corruption, the House majority noted that the Department of the Interior's Inspector General found evidence suggesting that the contract of the former Secretary of Commerce violated several Commonwealth laws and may have violated a section of the CNMI procurement regulation. Those are words of possibility, not the sort of certainty that should be required for impeachment. However, if anyone violated these provisions, it was the contractor, not the governor. There is no evidence that the governor in any way profited from this or that his motive for entering into the contract was anything other than the good of the Commonwealth. The, common, the governor cannot be expected to be an expert in the procurement regulations. That is why we have a director of procurement and supply who in this case certified that the contract was in compliance with the regulations. There are ways to cancel a contract if it turns out to be improper. But there's no basis to impeach the governor as in Article 8 or Mr. Speaker, of the resolution. Uh, Representative. In all due fairness to, to the other speakers that would be following uh, the former governor, I, I reminded the chair to to remind again the governor that his time is up and he should be wrapping up. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Tenorio, if, if you wish, you can, I see you have, you were reading from a written statement. If you wish, um, if you didn't get all your message across, you can provide uh, the copy of your statement to the sergeant at arms and we will make sure that every member has a copy all right thank you thank you mr tenorio uh, would any